This feels like a flashback, man. Well, I mean, I get it. it makes sense. Jimmy's here, right? Found a phone. Yeah. It looks like it's from 1967. Ooh, is this when it first started happening? It looks like there's renovations going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jimmy coming in. I found a phone. Interesting. Are we going to find out where this started? What started this? What do you think? On, off. Ah. I think off. Yeah. Okay, so he's not sure about Rebecca at this point. So is that just happened too? Maybe that was what it was. The bigger the lie, the harder it can be to dig out. I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Wait, on or off? So Rebecca's coming then. What are you doing, mate? Is it a seance? Yeah, Rebecca maybe. Three glasses. Is Jimmy coming too? Yeah, okay. This is her favorite meal. I can't remember what they were cooking in that flashback, but this looks kind of similar. I can't remember if it was fish or not. Okay, Jimmy talked about a lie. Getting out a lie. You look smashing, mate. Don't worry about it. Yeah, okay. Hey, what's with the candles? Yeah, I was wondering the same thing. Okay, so Jimmy's acting stum. The afternoon I've had. Two hours ago, I take the sea bass out. No sooner is it... Right. He's hiding the electric thing from Rebecca then. Jimmy was on board with it. Okay. Power goes down. I get on the phone to the city. To make a long story short, those bozos at P... Sorry, I am getting such Walt vibes from Chuck. Just, do you know what I mean? Do you remember those times where Walter would come in and he would just start talking about like this fake thing that we all knew was fake, right? And uh, he would just go on to this like, you know, elaborate story. Chuck doing the exact same thing here. Very Walt-esque in that sense. It's very interesting that they would kind of almost uh, compare the two because there are similarities. I think, you know, the, the ego, the uh, making of bad decisions, making decisions in regard to their families that harm their family. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big comparison between Chuck and Walt here. I think the show is kind of trying to throw it a little bit in your face and just be like, look. The deadbeat at 512 San Cristobal. And of course I'm 215. Sorry, the 251, 215 switcheroo. That is very, very ironic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Right, so I'm getting that this is kind of a bid, maybe, maybe to try and get her back. You know, well, the least to. I can do is oh. the dishes. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. Oh, isn't it nice, by the way? Sorry, isn't it nice just to see Chuck and Jimmy getting on? I just wish we could have this. I really wish that these brothers could have this relationship, but... Uh... I still can't get over Jimmy being a lawyer. Okay. Neither can I. Go on, let's talk about it. I mean, a real responsible citizen. Exactly. Yeah, Rebecca coming in and being like, look at him. Hey, turned over that leaf, didn't he? He went from uh, one thing and he changed his ways. Big word, considering a couple episodes ago. Chuck, I'm looking at you. And he went to the other end of the spectrum. A very responsible citizen. Exactly. That's what he could have been. It's what he could have been. She sees it. Why can't Chuck? I know, I know why he can't, but you know. How's the tour going? Good. Um, the Far East this fall. Uh, it was a, a, a raspberry Linzer to make ourselves feel better. Yeah, look at Jimmy Wingman in. The way that in Chuck's life, in the things that Chuck is trying to achieve, whether it's this, you know, whatever. This scene kind of demonstrates how Jimmy's supporting Chuck, right? In whatever endeavor in life he wants to achieve. And it just, it's the stark contrast of the way that Jimmy kind of is in regard to his brother and what he'll do for his brother. And the, or like, take that out of the equation, the respect and the care that he feels for his brother and the lengths he'll go to as a result. And it's like, I just find myself wondering when the roles have been reversed, if Chuck had been that kind of wingman to Jimmy, right? Even if he hadn't ushered him into HHM, which I think would have been fair, you know, sit him, sit Jimmy down and be like, look, it's not gonna happen, this is why. I think that's absolutely fair from Chuck's point of view, if that had been the case. Even so, even if Chuck had actually sat him down and been like, look, HHM's not gonna happen, but I will be there for you. I'm really proud of you for making this change. Let's do this, I can help you. Go out there, make it for yourself, and I'll be there every step of the way by your side, your wingman. I don't understand, like Chuck could have been that, and it's like, ugh, why, why not? And Jimmy did the exact same thing here. I know that this isn't professional, but I don't think it matters. I think it's all that matters is the fact that Jimmy is being there for his brother in something in his life that is very important to him. In the same way that I think it's very, it was very important at the time for Jimmy to make that change and become a lawyer and make that work. And it demonstrates, again, the differences between the two brothers and the dynamic of the relationship when you go from Jimmy's side and when you go from Chuck's side. Do you know what I mean? When you're looking through both of those two guys' eyes. I miss having one, one place to hang my head. Uh? Shit. Is that Jimmy? Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh. oh, God. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> Jimmy didn't take it off her. Keep it together, man. Keep it together. Oh, it's my conductor. Um, I have to take this. I'm Try to make yourself scarce. Go for a sh Go for a poo. Pretend. I don't know. Well, I can do that. A simple mistake. A simple mistake from Jimmy's part, but I have a feeling. I reserve judgment a little bit, but I have a feeling Chuck might blame Jimmy for this. I think it's a simple mistake. You could see the look on Jimmy's face and the way that he was looking happily at them because they were getting on, and then the horror almost and the shock when he heard the mobile phone. 16. Yeah. This is also still very new, I think, for Chuck at this time, and he's not used to having to deal with it in the same way that he is in the present. Yeah, hold on one second. Yeah, we can do it. You got it, man. You got it. Ah. Okay. All right, shoot. Damn, damn. Jimmy, Jimmy, do something, dude. Yeah. All right. Well, do you want me to... Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, mate. He's going to collapse, isn't he? Well, no, it's not just... Jimmy, man. Come on. Rebecca. Yeah, wait, well, he's trying, okay. What can he do other than like grabbing the phone? Ah. I was talking about Jimmy, but fair. I'll have to call you back. I'm sorry. Behave. Calm down. What is your problem? No, no, no. Hey, hey, hey. Let's take it down. Say something. Yeah, come on. You gotta tell her now. Cats out the bag. It is incredibly bad manners. No, no, no. It's very rude. Oh, I think this is, okay, so I, I understand why he's doing it, I think. He doesn't want to tell her because I think in Chuck's mind, he's ashamed of, I think he perceives it as a weakness, at least to Rebecca. I think I'm going back to that episode, right, called Rebecca, when we first saw her in the flashback and the way that I feel like their dynamic was very much, he felt inferior to her. She's very, she's a very successful woman. I think he, as much as like on the surface, there was no problem with that. I think under the surface, I do think there was something inside Chuck that felt like he needed to constantly try and impress her as a result of that. I'm not blaming him for it. It's the dynamic that we grow up with as men. I think you have to kind of deal with that, grow out of that because you are taught. I think, you know, this is the problem with the gender binary and the things we attach to it is that I think as a guy, if you're not the breadwinner, if you're not the most impressive person in your own life, right? And in any relationship you have that you're taught that you should be. And if you're not that, then that is a bit of an issue, right? Even if you don't know where that comes from, I think some men do find that internally that is working within them. And so it's like, I'm not trying to blame Chuck for that. I think it's a very understandable thing. I think especially of a man his age, right? Growing up, you know, when he did, he's, he's a bit closer to that war era that birthed that kind of ideal in society. You know, post-war and the men coming back, the men being the one to work, the woman looking after the house, that kind of dy dynamic, you know, and that I idea of the man being the man of the house, the breadwinner, goes out, works, pays for everything, you know, that kind of dynamic. I think with Chuck's generation, even if he wasn't necessarily a part of that so much, his parents were, and obviously parents are a very big influence and are going to influence you that way, right? That dynamic has taken, I mean, we're, we're still seeing that dynamic today a lot of the time. And that comes from that kind of era, the last hundred or so years, right? And we're still kind of just slowly coming out of that. So like I say, uh, I, I don't blame Chuck for that aspect to himself. But that's the thing. I think it takes a lot of inner inner working, self-reflection, self-awareness to identify that and deal with it, which we've seen Chuck doesn't have and just doesn't exercise generally. And again, I think that's partly a product of his generation as well. You're kind of taught to whatever you feel, whatever it is, you know, these deep, you just hide it. You just suppress it. You push it down and you get on and you go forward and you move forward, right? And so I, I very much respect that I'm coming from it from a, a perspective of my upbringing and the way that I have decided and chosen to live my life in that I'm much more, I try purposefully to reflect and to confront that stuff and deal with it. And we, we do luckily, fortunately, live in a society where we are allowed that space to talk about that and for it to be a, a topic of conversation. So do you know what I mean? I do absolutely understand. And it's like, I don't really blame Chuck for that. Do you know what I mean? But I think that dynamic exists because of his age, because of the generation he came from and just because of the person he is and what he was raised with, I, I would assume as well, right? So it's like, I completely understand where Chuck coming from when 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 it comes to that stuff but as a result of that I think because of who Rebecca is she's a very impressive woman I think she's very successful in her field which is this is the thing I think the issue almost I'm not even saying that she's more impressive than Chuck professionally because I think Chuck is very impressive professionally as well right he has this incredibly impressive CV, this incredibly impressive professional presence as well. I mean, we saw last episode, Jimmy was talking about the people on the bar and how he'd made some of their careers. That's huge. That's huge. I think they're, an, you know, if, if 
you want to put it that way, I don't think you'd have to, but since I'm kind of framing it that way, I think you, you can probably put him and Rebecca as equally on the, on the same level. But I think that's the thing is that I think Chuck has been taught, and that thing that I was talking about, and the, the generational thing, is that the man should be almost above the woman professionally, right? And I think that's coming into play, and, and the fact that he's not above her, or, and that's the dynamic, that's the that's the, almost the cruelness of that uh, that cycle, because I think probably part of the reason that he was attracted to her and likes her in the first place is because she is impressive, she's intelligent, she's very extremely skilled at what she does. It's so sad to see, I think, that he probably chose her as a partner, gravitated towards her as a partner, and found that connection intimately emotionally romantically because of those things while at the same time those things picked away at probably deep-seated a generational upbringing that chuck had it's such a cruel cycle that kind of thing i absolutely don't blame him for that i think you know i'm very much looking at him from the perspective of like damn that's really sad i wish he could unravel that i wish he could address that that's my point that's my point that's why sorry uh, i'm going on a tangent but this is all very important to why i think this way that's what that's why i thought that at the time because that's what I saw and this right here that I think is why he's hiding this illness from her because I think to a certain extent it does show weakness do you know what I mean like me sitting here I'm like that's not weak dude dude you're dealing with a very serious thing you know it's clearly affecting you in a very deep way there's nothing to be embarrassed about or ashamed of and I think Rebecca is the kind of person where she would show empathy towards him like, you know what I mean I think that's why he won't tell her why he he chose right then to reply in the tack that he did because he's still trying to keep it from her because he doesn't want to lower himself in her eyes as less than perfect because he needs to be perfect right he needs to strive for that and i think it comes into that inferiority that he feels around her to a certain extent because she is such an impressive person and that's really sad <sighs> uh i i'm sorry oh bless her I, I didn't know that you felt that way i didn't mean to offend you chuck bless her for that I'm, I'm, i may have overreacted that was very abrupt a really mature way for her to come at that actually instead of getting angry Instead of getting angry, really mature for her to settle herself down. That's interesting as well. What? How did she react at first? Hang on, let me see that. What is your problem? That, anger. She did react with anger, but then we see... It is incredibly bad. Right, and then Chuck says his thing. It's very rude. And then, uh, boom. I... I'm sorry. Right, look at that. That is such good emotional control from her because you, you could tell from the tone and the thing that she said immediately, she was angry, as anyone would be, right? Instead of escalating the situation, she gathers herself and comes back at him calmly. That's beautiful emotional control. And I think that's very important. It's, it's a very important contrast for the show to strike, actually, because it actually shows, gives us an example of an adult who does have awareness of the situation. She's like, okay, okay. And she does control her emotions. She doesn't let herself be ruled by these emotions. And, and, hey, and hey, just to be balanced, because I do feel like that, because considering what I've just talked about and Chuck, I'm talking about Jimmy as well. Like Jimmy doesn't have control over his emotions either. And it's, it's all the more impressive actually when I see Rebecca and it's like, it's easy to feel inferior, I would say. If, if, if you were gonna feel that way, I can absolutely understand why. I don't think you should. She's just a person that has control over herself and she's very skilled, very professional. Uh, accomplished right but I, I i just i can understand this feeling of inferiority that chuck felt considering where i know he's coming from because i think she is here exhibiting all the things that chuck doesn't have and jimmy doesn't have either wouldn't we have an easier show if these boys were like her and i wonder how much of that is practice being with chuck as well right and dealing with him handling him i guess a little bit maybe because we saw and i the, the, the thing that makes me wonder that is the line that he says after this I'm, I'm, i may have overreacted that it was very abrupt right no. it immediately calms him down it snaps him out of it, which I think so often doesn't happen with Jimmy because Jimmy keeps pressing, right? Jimmy keeps going. He doesn't stop. Jimmy doesn't have that emotional control that Rebecca just exhibited, which means that when Jimmy keeps pressing, keeps pushing, Chuck keeps pushing and pressing in return. And that's the problem. And I think, yeah, it's interesting that we see that from Rebecca and the way that it actually disarms Chuck. You know, that's what you need to do. You need to calm down. You need to control your emotions and be like, well, okay, sorry, I didn't realize that offended you. Fair enough, cool, cool, cool. And that disarmed him, calmed him down. And it's interesting that we get that shown to us. Uh, it's getting late. Yeah. Just give me a minute and we can... No, uh, um, I'll just get a cab, I don't want... Damn. A cab is the easiest. Damn, it was going so well. You, you can't let her leave like this. Just tell her what's going on. No. Right, and Jimmy appealing to him. She'll understand. She'll... She will. Would you rather she think you're a raging than know the truth? Exactly. No. Chuck. Look, if you won't tell her, then I will. Ooh. No, 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 no. Don't take that decision away from him, though. You will not tell her. You gotta let Chuck do that. 
Right. Good. Chuck is also right. He needs to tell her. The only chance to get her back, if that is the goal, which I think it is, is to tell her. Be honest and explain that situation because now, because that's the thing, we saw them beautifully getting on and having that conversation. I think they were starting to feel that. And she even said, you know, I'm missing having a home. It was prepped. And it's so sad that I think Chuck got in his own way there. And I think it's for the reasons that I was saying. And it's so sad as well, because I don't blame him for those reasons. I don't think he necessarily has control over those things. Just sad. It's sad. Hello and welcome to another Better Call Saul Sunday. That's right, the show that happens every single Sunday. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Today, episode five, chicanery. That's right. Let us see what it has in store. Do you know what's funny? I was doing Breaking Bad and I said chicanery, the word chicanery in a video. And I got so many comments saying like, chicanery. <laughs> That's how I read it. Okay. And I had no idea what that meant. I will be completely honest with you. Then I finished Breaking Bad and I was like, I actually did think I thought back and I was like, that, what, what were they talking about? Chicanery. I have no idea. And then when I started season three of uh, Better Call Saul and I clicked on episode one, I saw, I saw it in the episode list, chicanery. And I was like, That's what they meant. That's what they goddamn meant. The wily weasels that you are. I see you. I do. I see you. I'm very curious what we mean by chicanery. I do. But with that said, flamingo check. What? I'll be honest with you, right? Like, I didn't really think this through, okay? Um, there's not much I can do with this. I already did the drinking gag. Um, so, yeah. It was a gift, actually. What? Yeah! Fucking huge. Yeah, comment down below if you want to see for the last episode of Better Call Saul, the last flamingo check ever. Me just dressed as a giant flamingo. That's a joke. It's not happening, okay? I don't know. I mean, who knows? Pay me, I guess. Do you know what I mean? What are you waiting for, dude? Oh, the vet. What do you need? What do you need from the guy? Her? Yeah, just because you don't see swinging dick doesn't mean you can't tell a boy fish from a girl fish. <laughs> oh, yeah, see? Now I can see the lipstick. All right, gender roles, McCall. I don't know who McCall is. I'm so sorry. This is a living creature. It's not a piece of furniture. Boom. I love this guy. I need highly skilled, high-end, discreet, real pro. Interesting. Okay. Great job, Miss Wexler. Very refreshing. Okay. Dinner's on me. Kim, I knew you were good, but I didn't know you were this good. Right? Exactly. We couldn't have done it without you, and I hope you realize this means a whole lot of work coming your way. Get her on it. Oh, that's... that's great. Ah. Uh. Well, you don't sound like it's great. Yeah, you don't, mate. You gotta chill. This is the thing. She's clearly thinking. She's getting overworked by Jimmy. That's the problem. There is something you need to hear before we get any deeper in. Charles thinks that Jimmy somehow took control of your documents. Yeah, Kim's doing the wise thing here and uh, full disclosure, she's got to do this, yeah. Again, you know, it's the hard thing, but she's doing it. They were gonna find out sooner or later. It would look bad on her if she'd never told them. I think it could make some noise in public. I wanted to tell you this in the spirit of full disclosure. Yeah, fair, good on her. If you are not comfortable staying with me, Bless we her. can discuss options. That is the best way to go about this, yeah. Especially considering that she's just, I don't know what she just did, but. There's one thing I cannot abide, it's a man who won't own up to his mistakes. Hey, hey, hello. He's not gonna screw me out of the best mm -hmm. outside counsel I've ever had. Yes, sir. I love this guy, mate. Go for that dinner. Can you go for that dinner? Just get smashed. I'm so sorry. I know that's my solution for a lot of things. <laughs> uh, brilliant timing from her. Whatever she's just done, whatever she's just won them, and to, to make them come out of there and be like, dude, good work, you did awesome. Perfect timing for her to kind of bring that up. We appreciate the heads up, but you can call this baby put to bed. Now the most important thing, dinner. Yes. <laughs> seven good for you? Yeah, sweet. We move on to Colorado or Utah first. See you at seven. Hello, Paige sticking about. This Miguel thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're sure it's not gonna be a- Damn, why do I feel like it's gonna be now? Mesa Verde isn't involved in any way, shape or form. Okay. Yeah, and Paige trusts her because she's good and she's proved herself, but I just feel like this could be a crack. If Kim doesn't quite pull this off, which I suspect now that she might not, not cleanly. Yeah, she's not sure. A little bit of worry there. Yeah, yeah, she's under the, she's on the frying pan a little bit. Oh, hello. Chuck's coming in then. We're in the sound again. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I know when he's coming now. I think we can arrange having them in the back of the court. What's up, Howard? I appreciate all you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, it's, you know what, I was gonna say, it's really nice that they're accommodating Chuck, and it is, by the way, that's not my point. I wasn't gonna be like, but, it's very nice they're accommodating him. Well, there is a but coming though, it's not mine, behave yourself, stop it. Hey, no, behave, no, 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 that's my OnlyFans, okay, no, I, I don't know. Joke, it's a joke, stay, hey, stop it, just me sitting on pies, I swear, that's all it'll be. <laughs> anyway, back on topic, I'm so sorry, not all pie sitters cry. 
I'm so, it's the best quote of the show. I'm so, like, I will fight people on that. I will. Anyway, sorry. The only reason they're doing this is because Chuck is so, and this isn't a, a comment on Chuck, by the way, but this has only been done because of his place in the professional hierarchy. He's a very respectable lawyer. He's very high up. He's a name partner of HHM. He's very respected in the field. And so he's been given that care and that consideration. And it does make me really sad when I see this, because it's like, again, it's that privilege. And it's not that I'm saying that Chuck shouldn't have that. He should. What I'm saying is everyone should have that. And I don't feel like it's given equal kind of attention because of the consideration that we give more so to people who are you know socially respected more and that is an issue and that's really sad to see because i do feel like the reason he is given so much consideration is because of his place in the world mr alley i wonder if you'd give us a moment go on howard what is it how you feeling chuck because this is a lot to ask right maybe you don't need to testify at all no, I do. I'm the only person who can adequately explain the context of that tape. Interesting. This isn't about me or my health. Okay. This is about PR. Right. What Jimmy did is unconscionable, yes. But one of my jobs is to safeguard the firm's reputation. Mm, there we go. That's Howard's sore point again. It's not the time to worry about how we look. Mm. This is about what's right and what's wrong. Interesting. These two men are odds a little bit because the line that he said, it's like, it's not a time to care about how we look. No, no, no. That is a big trigger for Howard. Howard cares about that a lot. Their reputation, the firm's reputation is huge for him. And uh, Chuck uh, kind of directly coming against that. It's interesting. So we are kind of seeing. I don't think they're going to come against each other here. But... But subtly, I think Howard probably would have railed against that line, I think. What, a year of suspension? Maybe two? He just Yeah, it's interesting. Howard bottles it here. He's not happy at all by Chuck's very selfish, brotherly vendetta motivation, but he's not quite at a point where he's willing to come up against Chuck. Not yet, anyway. He deserves disbarment, not some slap on the wrist. Mm -hmm. There's only one way forward. Yeah. Okay. Let justice be done, though the heavens fall. This will do nicely. Interesting. Yeah. That line that I said affected Howard. It's interesting. We go back and uh, linger on the shot of him. I don't think he liked that. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Maybe uh, I think the first hmm, a little telltale sign, perhaps, that we are or will eventually see a split between Chuck and Howard, or at least see them come towards. In the matter of James M. McGill, the State Bar intends to prove the following violations of the... Okay. It's always interesting when they start on the toothbrushes, and it kind of symbolizes this solidarity of uh, Kim and uh, Jimmy, this togetherness. The committee will agree the disbarment. All right, Kim, you gotta be in your A game. But there is another side to this story, but about two brothers. Okay. Whose relationship after years of strain. Bowled over. Finally broke. Mm hmm Yeah, it makes me wonder in Breaking Bad whether actually Jimmy does have a, a law license. I'm thinking of like the fact that he's using an alias as well makes it seem like he didn't because he would have needed that to practice even in Breaking Bad but he's doing it under an alias which makes me think makes me believe that perhaps he does get disbarred if not now at some point he demanded Charles turn over the evidence he'd been collecting. objection boom nice Kim I think further at this time Mr. Wexler oh hello Kim coming against Howard I love this go on Kim you testified you've known my- Interesting. The way that she takes a moment here. <clears throat> the cough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She looks up, meets his eyes. Thank you, Mr. Look at that. Chairman. He's looking calmly back at her. Gets up. <clears throat> Look at this. Looks up, meets his eyes there. Pauses a second. Yeah, puts buttons up. She's stealing herself. It shows a little bit of nervousness, actually, as well, I think. She's ready to go. She's ready to go, looks up, meets Howard's face, meets his eyes, and suddenly, suddenly, if only for half a second, it's boss and employee, I think. Do you know what I mean? She feels that. And then she almost feels naked. Do you know what I mean? It's like, and that's why I think almost she buttons up. It's this uh, tell of professionality. It's almost like a reclaiming of that power that I feel like she felt like she lost in that moment when she looked up, you know, took her time and then met the eyes of her former boss. And then she's like, okay, boom. No, 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 I've got this, don't worry. Buttons up her jacket. And it's like, no, 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 I'm professional. I'm a lawyer. I'm allowed to be here. I've earned this. And I feel like her taking her time over this actually conveys a lot of emotion and a lot of how she's feeling here and this little balance the little silent battle that she had there just in regards to the dynamic and the past between the two of them there and I think a little bit a shade of nervousness there and her overcoming that and also just you know forgetting that for a second just her taking her time gathering herself to go forward his brother asked to hire him in the mailroom what was your opinion of him then I thought interesting 
He had a lot of get up and go. Nice. He was a hard worker. You had a nickname for him, didn't you? Hello. Charlie Hustle. How'd you feel when you found out he'd become a lawyer? Surprised. He'd put himself through law school, taking the bar exam without telling any of the partners. Yeah, that shows initiative. He bootstrapped his way into yeah. a law degree while working in your mail. Yes. Did you consider taking him on as an associate? We did. Yeah. Sounds like you didn't hire him. Why not? With that kind of... We're actually getting into the nitty gritty of it. I love that. The partners decided it would be best to avoid the appearance of nepotism. Ah! <laughs> no. No. Oh. Oh, God. Come on. You got two H's in your law firm's name, dude. Yeah, are you serious? And you wanted to avoid nepotism. Oh, ooh, Howard boy. No, 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 no. That's not going to fly. That's not going to fly. I love, by the way, I love that we're getting into this. We're actually going back to that moment and getting a little bit of truth. Because as much as the nepotism thing is absolutely just a cover, right? We know, we know why. That absolutely wasn't why. I, and it is funny that he gives that as an excuse because, because. <laughs> That's so rich. That's so rich, Howard. Stop it. You audacious slut. But it's really lovely, actually, to see... I think we are. We got a little bit of a nugget, a little bit of a grain of truth there from Howard when she asked, like, what did you think of him? And he was like, I saw a lot of go up and go. And it's funny, actually, that phrase, because I think, honestly, when he found out as much as it was a surprise to him that Jimmy passed the bar, I think, actually, if it had been left down to Howard, he would have given him a chance. That's what I'm kind of hearing there, a little bit. I'm inferring. I absolutely am. But the get up and go, and I think he surprised them. And it's like, I don't think, I think if before Jimmy did that, if you'd have asked Howard, like, hey, this guy passing the bar, Pfft, no. Do you know what I mean? Howard wouldn't have believed that. And I think the fact that he did, really probably prove something to Howard about Jimmy. And I think he would have give, given him a go in the same way that he gave Kim a chance, right? And as much as I'm talking about how Howard has treated Kim and I don't think it's been very good, I think it's not been the best. He did give her a chance, he did. Like, you know, credit where credit is due, he did. He saw potential and he gave her that chance. And I think he would have seen the same in Jimmy. And if not for Chuck, I think perhaps Howard actually would have shown the same kind of care that I would have wanted from Chuck if Chuck hadn't been involved. To avoid the appearance of nepotism. Why though? Why? Why? Can I just ask why? Why would that have been a bad thing? Who would have been coming at you? Do you know what I mean? Who would have been writing that newspaper story? Who would have been coming at you and being like, I, like most law firms surely have probably got a, a, a I was going to say a dash of nepotism, but let's be real. Probably like if you went through them, a generous sprinkling, but you know what I mean? Like what a flimsy reason. Even if we was to take that at face value, what a flimsy reason. Nepotism. We felt hiring Jimmy might. <laughs> Nepotism. Mm -hmm. Your firm is Hamlin Hamlin. <laughs> right? Who's the other Hamlin? <laughs> yes, Kim. Absolutely smoke him. My father. Ah. <laughs> F*** off. Oh, come on. That's so funny. That's so funny. The way that the other lawyer just like hangs his... <laughs> Kim's Which face. Which partner was the most... Kim's... I've got to watch that again. That's so funny. My father. Oh, that's so silly. That's so funny. Her face. Which partner was the most concerned with nepotism? Yeah, go on. Charles McGill. Uh -huh. So Jimmy's own brother blocked. Right. How are the hiring practices of Hamlin, Hamlin, McGill? Well, let her finish. It's relevant to understand the relationship between these. Right, exactly. We'll uh, give you some leeway, Miss West. Sweet. Eventually, he was hired by the firm of Davis and Maine. I'd be happy to say more about that. Mm. <laughs> of course you would. Jimmy was struggling to build his solo law practice, and yet every single day, without fail, he brought his brother food. Yeah. Could you speak to the terms of Charles's leave of absence? Charles McGill's mental health isn't at issue. Mr. Hamlin is not a psychiatric professional. Fair enough. I have nothing further. Okay. Well, what are we doing? What's that about? What are you still doing here? Flight's delayed. How delayed? What's going on? 40 minutes last I checked. Oh. Keep me posted. Okay, what's he got her doing? A flight to where? Interesting. I'm begging your pardon. Um, the defense requests a moment to review. Stalling, okay. Go on. Yeah. What are we doing? Yeah. Stalling. Yeah, okay. Yes, my brother has many admirable qualities. In some ways, I can say I admire. All right, buddy. Too cold. I love my brother. But Ted Kaczynski's brother loved him too. I just did a Google search and it is wild to me that Chuck just compared Jimmy to the Unabomber. This is an unhinged way of perceiving Jimmy. Doesn't it tell you a lot that he's having to rehearse this? He's having to rehearse the degree to which he conveys his love for his brother. Isn't there something inherently dishonest in that? Rather than going into it and just being like, I will just be honest, I will tell the truth. Which is what Chuck, knowing what we know of the way that he feels about the law and being strict to it, should be acting. 
that's how we should be acting. Taking what we know of Chuck and that belief in the law and trusting in it and upholding it to the highest degree. At this point being involved in this, Chuck shouldn't be sat here rehearsing. He should just be sat here being like, I will go into that room. I will let the law do its work. I will let the lawyers do their work. And I will just be honest to make sure that the law is satisfied. There is an element of dishonesty there. Bear in mind, I'm not saying he's outright being dishonest, right? There's a distinction in the way that I'm talking there, the way that I phrase that, because I think he is being honest. I think he does love his brother in his own way. I don't think it manifests itself, like I've said, in the, in the best ways a lot of the time, but I think he does love him. I think he does care for him. I think he does believe, like I've said, that this is the best for him. He believes that, I know he does, but I just think there is an element of dishonesty in the way that he is approaching this. And I think that does go against what he has said what he has professed that he stands for in regard to the law. Sanctimonious. Yeah, you know what I mean? He's really testing it out in his mouth to, to see how it sounds. And it's like, dude, just be honest and let the words speak for themselves, mate. Mm? If you were abiding by what you had stated were the rules that you live by, you would just go in there. You wouldn't be overthinking it this hard. And what you're seeing here is that he's overthinking this because this is so important to him. What's important to him? Making his brother suffer, disbarring his brother and changing his life for the worse, right? That's what's at stake here. And I will actually repeat something that I put in a pinned comment last episode. I've seen this comment repeated a few times now, enough to kind of take notice and kind of comment on it. I've seen a lot of people be like, well, we've seen where Jimmy gets to in Breaking Bad. We see where he gets to in Saul. So Chuck is right because he's judging him appropriately because we know as the audience where he's going. Chuck is right. And it's like, no. That's being disingenuous to the chronicle of events, right? You can't look at the future and use that to justify Chuck's actions in the present. Because that's this is the present that we're talking about right now. When what we are seeing in the present is driving him towards that future. There's a big difference in that. I'm seeing Saul being shaped before me based on what Chuck is doing. Because what have we seen in the show? We've seen Jimmy act in the way that he's acted. We've seen him break the law in season one. We've seen him like shirk things and, you know, manipulate things and, you know, do the billboard thing to get clients and all that stuff. And that's fair and that's fine. I don't think at that point he was on the path of Saul. This is the thing. I don't think he was, I don't think Saul was inevitable in the way that I do feel like a lot of people think it was. Um, I don't think he was always going there. I think he is now. And when I say now, I mean season three, like coming from the end of season two into season three. I think before that he wasn't on the path of Saul, truly. I think what we saw from season one to two was, yeah, he broke the law, he did what he did. That wasn't right, right? He shouldn't have been doing that. But then he got into season two and we got to a place where he was actually, he was going into elder law and he was making a thing of himself. He was doing a good thing for his community. He was going and getting these old people and making sure they were looked after, cared for, making sure their wills were sorted and all that stuff. That is a morally good thing. He was, you know, being a member of his society in a really positive way. And to a large extent, I'd put aside, you know, he'd put aside their Davis and Maine and all that stuff. He uh, decided that he wasn't, that, that wasn't what he wanted. That wasn't what made him happy. And that was great. He made a change. He confronted in himself what was make, what he really wanted. And he shifted his life, made a decision that I think personally bettered his life, right? And brought him to this place where he's practicing law solo again, in tandem with uh, with Kim, um, practicing elder law, right? At that point, at that point, he's purely helping people. He's not breaking the law to help these old folks. He's, he's purely using the law to help those old folks. At that point, he is on a path that is very much not Saul. That is the choice he has made, right? To put that aside, practice elder law, help old folks. Then we get the kind of the brother vendetta, the brother back and forth coming into play again. And then what happened, happened. And that's not me condoning what uh, Jimmy did. I mean, at the time you saw me kind of being like, ooh, this is a bit too far. I don't want to spend this time rehashing things. But the only reason Jimmy got back involved in that was because Chuck got involved because of Jimmy. Right. And then Jimmy broke the law. Again, you know, the involvement of his brother kind of coming into play again, Chuck, and diving him back into that world. And it's like, again, if, if Chuck had actually seen the change and the choice that Jimmy had made in the same way that we as the audience have, Chuck should have been able to leave Jimmy alone. He's made his decision in life. That's what he wants to do. He's happy and he's very much not on the path of Saul. And then Chuck's insistence to set this trap actively set a trap for Jimmy, lure him into it. And then, you know, we find ourselves where we are today in the courtroom is an active taking Jimmy's choice away from him. Do you know what I mean? That's what I'm getting at. That's the, that's like the crux of my argument here is that his choice 
to focus on elder law and have his practice with Kim, which I think without Chuck's involvement would have gone on to thrive and would have gone on to be just that. Without Chuck's involvement, that's what it would have been. And I think that is a path unto itself that wouldn't have led to Saul. Chuck's involvement meant that that choice got taken away from Jimmy. Now he's been threatened with disbarment. Now he's been threatened with all this stuff. That's getting taken away from him. And it's these kinds of decisions by people like Chuck that are taking the autonomy from Jimmy and his life. And yeah, Jimmy is culpable for that to a certain extent as well, right? He keeps doing these things that endanger himself, that give Chuck the angle to come in and do this. But at the same time, that doesn't make Chuck exempt from it either. Chuck is absolutely involved in that decision-making process. The future that we know doesn't make Chuck right to do that. Chuck doing that, coming in, is making the future that we know come about. And that's a very important distinction. Jimmy was never destined for Saul, but the toxic relationship and the vendetta that Chuck has for him is directing him there. You can't use the future to justify Chuck's actions here. That's disingenuous, but also that's just not how time works. <laughs> he has good in him, but the law is too important. <laughs> Oh, come, stop, just drop that. Honestly, man, you're like beating it like a dead fish. Can you stop? It was pointed out to me, by the way, that like uh, Chuck is a thief. He stole uh, a newspaper. Do you remember? I don't know when it was actually. Was it season one? I think it was season Yeah, it was season one because it was after the billboard thing. He went over the road and as much as he left money for it, that's not how that works. That's still theft. He didn't have the permission of that lady, right? He is literally a thief. He's broken the law. He's broken the law for all the, the people who defend Chuck as this bastion of the law. He's not at all. He's, he's literally a criminal. Okay, that's a bit too far. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But like, he's not this bastion of the law that he thinks he is. The law is too important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing you're repeating. I mean, look, any lawyers want to want to chime in in the comments and like, supply some clarification on that, feel free. She earned it and she needs it. I did it to help her. It's worrying because actually this paints Kim as biased as well. And I wonder whether the opposing counsel is going to kind of draw attention to that. And I thought you'd just say, oh, f I made a mistake and go on with your life. I wonder what that guy thinks. So can I uh, tell Howard you're not quitting or retiring or whatever? Any human being listening to this can tell that the whole point of it was to make Chuck feel better. Tell Howard you're not quitting or retiring. This bit here, it really actually, as much as it's damning to Jimmy, it really does humanize him in a certain way too. You do realize you just confessed to a felony? He was led into that. That was why Chuck asked that question. Besides, it's your word against mine. That doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> However much you want to talk about it. Your phone, sir? I left it in the car. <gasps> oh, did he not? Did he not leave it in the car? And is he going to prove, I wonder, whether this condition that Chuck has is selective at times? Wow. Yeah, that's what those cones were there for. Interesting. Privilege. Sorry, I don't say that with uh, judgment. I do feel like... Uh... Oh, buddy! Buddy! Okay, I'm going to finish my thought. I'm so sorry. I'm going to go back and play that again because it's, it's our guy. Oh my God, of course he's, uh, he's Jimmy's man, isn't he? Of course he is. Saul's man. Yeah, I don't say privilege with any judgment in mind, but I, I do feel like that was put in there specifically purposefully to remind us as the audience of that. It's to show us how much privilege constantly Chuck is given. It doesn't automatically make him bad. It does automatically give him an advantage which is significant. Jimmy's never given that. Yeah, buddy. Hello, hello, hello. What did he lift? Oh, that's who he hired. Of course he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My guy is so good at the pickpocketing, man. My brother, whatever else can be said of him, can be quite clever. <sighs> There's some condescension in that too. Can be quite clever. Just say he's clever. Just let you just let him have that. Jesus. Do you know what I mean? Like why? Stop, stop it. Stop, stop layering it with barbs, man. It's part of the problem. We saw it with Kim last episode. We're seeing it now here with Jimmy. I'd like to hear what he has to say. We'll extend you the same latitude on cross, Miss Wexler. Nice, I'm looking forward to that. You do sound somewhat unhinged on the recording. What you heard was theater. Uh would you say that your illness affects your ability to think clearly? It affects me physically. Sorry, I know I know that um, he is kind of putting this on a little bit for the court and the questioning. People have come to me in comments about Chuck's mental illness influencing how he reacts to his brother and how he is with his brother. If it's just physical, like, sorry, but his mental illness, the electromagnetism, how is that getting in the way of how he actually behaves in relation to his brother? Like, unless people are, again, talking in my comments about things that haven't been discovered yet by me by watching the show, please don't do that. Again, I'm very staunch against spoilers do not spoil me, please. Do you hate your brother? Interesting. Absolutely not. I love my brother. I love my brother. <laughs> 
Yeah, okay. No, I, I sorry, I, I do, I believe him. I do, I think he does. I was laughing because I was right <laughs> about what he was gonna say. There's nothing malicious in Jimmy. Correct. He has a way of doing the worst things for reasons that sound almost noble. Fair, fair comment. The law is too important to be toyed with. It's mankind's greatest achievement. Is it? The rule of law, the idea that no matter who you are, your actions have consequences. No, I think there's naivety there with Chuck. I think he's got a point when he talks about Jimmy and Jimmy's intentions towards the law. I think he's spot on. I think it does show naivety to call the law mankind's greatest achievement. I do think that sums up his character very well, but the law can be so manipulated. I'm so sorry, like, do you know what I mean? It's not always fighting for the innocent party, it's not. And as much good can come from law, like, it's not infallible, it really isn't. And I do think that that is a bit of an archaic perception of the law. At the same time, I absolutely believe that Chuck believes all this. Of course, of course he does. That's why I did what I did, not to hurt him, but to protect something that I hold sacred. I believe him when he says that. It's like, I've, I, again, I'm repeating myself, but like, I think the things in, in himself that are making him act the way that he does are so deep seated that he doesn't recognize them. He doesn't recognize that that's not the true reason. I don't think that's the true reason at all. And again, I've talked about this a lot. I'm not gonna rehash it here. The state bar arrests. All right, Kim, let's go. We need to put on the Stolen again, yeah? Francesca's gone. Be... Right. Oh, Chuck's gonna... Oh, hello. Oh, hello. Oh, hello. Okay. Damn. Hello, Rebecca. Oh, Chuck clocking this. Chuck clocking this as a, as a tactic. Fair play to him, because it is. It absolutely is. Wonder what ruling Rebecca privately is gonna have on this whole situation. Ooh, baby. Sorry, I am. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna get another beer. There's uh, 15 minutes left, but I am very much looking forward to this. I will be back in two seconds. All right, let's get back into it. Oh, he's not a happy chappy. Chuck, I wish you told me. Yeah. I, I can't believe what you've been... Yes, you should have told her, mate. Oh, you're here to help because all this is so stressful for me. Dude, stop it. It is. He's worried about you, Chuck. In spite of everything that's happened between the two of you. Yeah. He cares. Yeah, agreed. He does. Well, that you had been sick. He sent me pictures of the house. Chuck, my God. Right, that was the gambit. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't want to upset you. Mm -hmm. I can't believe she didn't know this whole time. She just didn't know what he was. As much as I said in the flashback, it should be, it should have been up to him to tell her. And, and I, I still stand by that. It should have been. It's been what, like at least two years. I can't remember the time frame exactly. Since that moment, since that flashback, because he was in the, in the mail room by that point. This is too long. She should have known. She should have known before this. Uh, I'm going to be in town for a few days. This might be good for him. And I would love to spend some time with you. Nice. But right now, I, I think I should go. Bless her. No, no, please. I want you to stay. Really? You don't seem happy to see me. <laughs> and for a moment, let's just... I think I have talked about this a little bit before. But let's talk about this for a second. Since she left, who has he had? He's had Jimmy, really, you know. But other than that, he's been isolated in that house all alone. Yeah, sure, maybe an occasional visit from Howard. But, you know, let's say two, three years living life like that. No social media. I don't think Chuck would have found social media that engaging anyway, right? He's not really that kind of person. But do you know what I mean? Like, just, I, I don't know. I don't know. No TV. No, I don't think this man really has a hobby. I mean, he plays the piano. I don't know if he was doing that. Do you know what I mean? That's what I'm getting at is that I don't think he was doing much other than reading, maybe, which, hey, hey, reading's amazing. I love to read. You know, getting yourself caught up in a good book for like two, three years, though, that mostly being the only thing that you do, you know, other than like reading the newspaper, drinking coffee. Dude, dude, that kind of isolation, that kind of like social isolation, not only that, like the professional isolation, the kind of almost tamping down of on his humanity, I think. And again, not in an awful way, but I just mean in the sense of like, he, he hasn't really been going out to the shop. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think you get a lot of humanity from just doing that one simple action, right? You know, you walk down the street, you feel the sun on your face, you know, the wind as it blows past you. Going to the shop, even if you're going out, getting something, hey, thanks, yeah, that'll be, okay, cool, there you go, thanks, see you later, man. That You get a lot from that. As small as it is, you get a lot from that kind of thing. And 
without that kind of thing at all. Jimmy coming and bringing his groceries, you know, bringing all the things that he needed, that Chuck needed, it really isolates Chuck not in the literal sense of the word, but also from humanity. And I think therefore as a link to his own humanity as well. Do you know what I mean? He's not experiencing life in its basic form. You know, he doesn't have connection with any other people than Jimmy and, and later on Ernie and, and, you know, Howard as well. I don't think Howard's really truly a friend though, like a, a comrade. I think he is very much a work partner. Right. And, and I'm just, I'm for a moment, I am just kind of looking at him and that picture and I'm like, dude, I'm not surprised the level of suppression that he's kind of exhibiting, the level of kind of almost social abandonment that he's practicing. It really puts kind of his behavior and who he is as a person and I think his ultimate happiness as a person right now into perspective. It makes a lot of sense and he's been missing so much. And I think that does affect a person. And I think that is kind of the person we have before us. And I think almost the warning, the danger of becoming like Chuck, if you take yourself out of community, humanity, and taking those kinds of simple things away, just going out and having a walk, even if it's just a walk, or going to the shop and buying something, and having that, that small interaction with another person that isn't someone you know. I think these things are important, and I think the lack of them are really affecting and have been affecting Chuck in a really, really big way, especially over a period of time that it's been. I mean, by the way, and it's funny that we have uh, almost a real world example of that. I mean, we had what, uh, you know, being in 2020, at least three months of isolation the first time, and then, you know, we had various isolations after that as well. I don't really know exactly exactly how it was in America. I know there was, you know, some isolation or attempt at isolation going on. We've experienced that for a short amount of time. Imagine that for like three years, because that's essentially what Chuck has experienced. Imagine the effect that it had on him, because, you know, we all dealt with that differently. I think some people struggle with it more. And I guess what I would appeal to is like, how did that make you feel for that? And it wasn't an insignificant amount of time. How did that make you feel? Not only that, I mean, in the UK, we had, you know, times where we were allowed to go out for, you know, mandated walks almost, or like you could go to the shop. You you had that, you had that boon. Imagine not having that. We have experienced this for a small bite-sized time. And I think a lot of people really struggle with that and lost a lot of social skills because of it and a lot of who they were because of it. Imagine that on a greater scale, no contact with anybody, no going out for walks for two to three years, mate. You've been sold a bill of goods, Rebecca. I want you to see what's what. Interesting, I don't know if it's gonna go your way. Honestly, Kim's still got her time. She's not what I expected. Mm, yeah, she's a gem. She's a bit of one of a kind from what I've seen. You know, she's gonna hate you when this is over. Maybe. Yep. Do you think? I think she's cleverer than that. To appreciate all the context, I think she is cleverer than that. We'll see though. I haven't seen what they're gonna do. Um, I'd like to turn cross-examination over to my co-counsel, James McGill. Mm, interesting, okay. Well, there's been a lot of fuss about it, but you and I have never really talked about this tape. You yeah, agreed. We lost the opportunity when you burglarized my house. Uh-huh, but you didn't uh, provide the opportunity before that either, Chuck. Oh, is this where you claim the tape is spurious? Don't. That it's not really your voice. No, that's me on the tape. Hello. But still, I have some questions. Nice. Objection. Well, the circumstances of the recording are materially relevant. Overruled. The nice, nice. Again, really interesting, really nice that we are seeing Jimmy's expertise here as a lawyer. He's given that time, that platform to show what he can do and how actually, yeah, he is a lawyer. He knows his stuff and he can do it too. I like that they gave, the show gave the time for that. Right, so shiny insulation and space blankets all over the walls and the... Interesting, his manner. Funny, isn't it? Everyone so far, uh, this Mr. Ali and Kim going to the witness. Funny how Jimmy takes himself away from Chuck and appeals actually straight to them. And I think that tells you a lot about the kind of lawyer that he is and the special little source that he's got and his way of doing things as well and I think that's the kind of the magic of what actually Jimmy brings to the table as a lawyer is that he does he appeals to the hearts as well as the minds of the people in the courtroom and I think him coming over actually and talking to them is uh, really significant and shows a lot of character in his technique. What this actually achieves is a differentiation in how they perceive Jimmy. He's not a lawyer just presenting evidence, he's a human being coming to them face to face and talking appealing to them. It's more likely to get them on his side. It was like being inside of a disco ball. Do you have a point? Well, 
Um, I'm impressed. It's funny how Chuck keeps replying to him. Like, this isn't necessarily, it's almost not like a courtroom. It's not like a witness and a lawyer. It's like they're having a conversation. It's interesting the framing that that kind of uh, erects because it is almost, like I say, as close as we're going to get in a formal manner, Chuck and Jimmy going one-on-one. -on -one. Because we had that moment before where Chuck kind of skipped ahead and he was like, oh, this is the moment where you uh, say that it's not your voice on the tape. And Jimmy was like, no, 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 that was my voice. That kind of interjection from Chuck is almost like, okay, lawyer to lawyer, they're pitting themselves against each other. They're really, they're bringing out their professions and being like, right, this is mine, this is yours, let's go at it. And that's what this is right now, and I love that for that. That's absolutely what I wanna see as the audience. I didn't entrap you. I provoked an admission in- There we go, lawyer speak. In adverse interest, that's not the same thing. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. How did you know it would work? What do you mean? Uh-huh. How did you know your provocation would work? Why'd you think? A bunch of shiny plastic would make me say anything. Empathy, yeah. Isn't it because you knew that it was precisely yeah. the thing that would worry me so much that I'd say anything to talk? Yeah. Objection. Okay, withdrawn. Yeah. Let's let's get back to your. Good. I was playing up my condition. Usually, it's a perfectly normal. Is it? You think your house is mm -hmm. normal? Can yeah. I call your attention to Exhibit Nine? Exposed wires. Did the doctor think this was a physical condition? Right. Mr. McGill's mental health is not at issue. No, the state bar opened the door to this on direct when the witness talked about his supposed play acting. Mm. We discussed a physical allergy, not a mental disability. Potato, potato, it comes down to this. Nicely done. You need to know if I believe that tape was evidence. And I say it was evidence of only one thing. Go on. My brother hates me. Ooh, interesting, interesting. Again, I will rail against Jimmy there. I understand why he thinks that. He doesn't. Chuck doesn't. I don't know, it's interesting. I think he holds deep-seated resentment towards him, right? And that's the distinction. Or at least what I would say, if there is an element of despising there, uh, you know, we're getting to synonyms, I suppose. But if we are saying that that is there and that exists, and I think that there is an element of maybe hate, despising, dislike there, I think alongside that is love. I don't deny Chuck's love for his brother. But I do think it sits amongst the bad feeling as well. That he lied to me to get me to tell the truth. I lied to my brother to make him feel better. Which of us you believe depends on how we all understand the mind of Charles McGill. Right, compelling. Well, we did promise the defense. You did, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You may proceed, Chairman. but watch yourself. <laughs> all right, mate, chill. <laughs> oh, hey. Yeah, 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 you got your floor. Uh, talk about when these symptoms first started. It was shortly after you were divorced, is that right? Really, right, shortly after, shortly after. That very much implies the split from Rebecca was was very integral to that. Let's, let's let him carry on. You think the stress of the divorce brought on the illness? I doubt it, it was an amicable split. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it wasn't affecting to you though. And again, I think considering the lack of self-reflection, self-awareness we've seen displayed by Chuck, he wouldn't know truly whether that influenced that or not. I don't think he's a good enough source to work that out based on what we've seen. I can't see what purpose this serves. I can. Oh, hello. I've been suffering from it for some time, but I went to great lengths to conceal that fact from her. Okay. I'm sorry I deceived you, Rebecca. Good. I didn't want you to think less of me. What did I say? What did I say, man? What did I say? I'm pretty sure I said those exact words. I'm not actually sure, but I'm pretty sure I said those exact words, man. Oh, I'm good. Oh, I'm good. I'll take a sip. I'll take a sip of victory. Oh, ho, ho. Ah, that tastes good. That tastes good. Tastes like what, Tyler? Tastes like victory. Tastes like victory. I'm so sorry. A little bit of humility, Tyler, occasionally might, might, might serve you better. Never. Never. <laughs> oh, I told you. I didn't want you to think less of me. God, I was right on the money, wasn't I? Another sip, another sip. Now Jimmy has outed me. Here we are. He's losing it a little bit. He's losing control. He's hoping this will break me down. Hmm, maybe. Have I answered your questions to your satisfaction? Ooh, very gently delivered. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that was it. If you'd had, uh, I don't know, lung cancer, would you have told Rebecca then? Move it along. Fair. You don't have to answer that. I want to get down to brass text. Go on, yeah, yeah, do it. This illness, what does it feel like? Oh, he's still got his phone. I told you, I told you when the lady came up to him and he was like, no, 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 I left my phone in the car. I bet he didn't. I bet his whole shtick is gonna, he's gonna take a phone out of his pocket and be like, you didn't feel it, did you? Mm, I bet you, I bet you. There's a tightness in my chest. Right, he's gonna ask, do you feel it right now? Burning pain, the pain spreads everywhere. Sounds horrible. Does it hurt I right now? so good. Does it hurt right now? I am so good. There's always 
some discomfort, yes. Yeah. My goodness. There's a tightness in my chest. Yeah. Difficulty breathing. And he's gonna, and he, because he doesn't feel it, and he's gonna be boom. So he didn't feel it. Proof. Proof. Very hard to prove. If he pulls the phone out of his pocket, that is proof right there to them. Electricity is everywhere in the modern world, but I very much appreciate. Yeah, he doesn't see it come in. Their accommodation. Come on, Chuck. I can handle this fine. Hello. Intensity drops off with distance per the inverse square law. Oh my God, did he plan? Do you think, uh, I can't remember his name. I'm so sorry. What's his face in Breaking Bad? Do you think he planted something on Chuck, like a phone or something? I got it close to you, close to your skin, you'd know. I would feel it, yeah. <sighs> Chuck is damning himself, I think. Can you tell us where the nearest source is right now? Jimmy, do you have something in your pocket? Uh, I don't know. Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, my cell phone. From this distance, you should feel it, and you don't, do you? Hello. Dale, you were warned to leave your electronics out. He's proven a point. It's all right. This is just a theory after having watched the episode, by the way, but I suspect the reason he's not feeling anything here is because he knows Jimmy to a point. He knows about his empathy and doesn't believe Jimmy would actually put an electronic device in his hand or near him. I think the reason Jimmy does trap him here is because he subverts this idea of his usual empathy and chucks mind by actually, eventually, putting something in his hand. The Phone battery, by the way. We haven't actually seen that scene yet, but we'll get there. Chuck doesn't expect that. It's doubly sad because the reason this gambit works is because Chuck expects Jimmy's empathy for him, which proves deep down Chuck knows how much Jimmy cares for him, never believed he would ever compromise that, and actively not only takes that for granted, but actively exploits it regularly, behaving in the ways that he does and has while truly knowing that his brother loves him. This scene and the way he knows and expects the battery to not be in the phone proves he is very aware of how Jimmy feels towards him. It's all right. May I? Ooh, Chuck, what have you got? Chuck coming back hard. Fair play to him. Just as I thought. There's no battery in here. Where is the battery? In his pocket. It's a physical response to stimuli. Check your pocket. This is interesting. The way that Jimmy has played this actually really stresses to, to kind of put that phone in front of him and be like, hey, do you feel this kind of thing? And then him to open it and be like, the battery's gone, mate. Yeah, no, I sense that. Really drives the point home, I think, if he's gonna now find the battery in his pocket or something. This speech by Chuck, to really drive that point home. Be like, no, 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 I'd have felt it. The fact that he didn't feel it if it was right next to his body, so damning. What do I have to do to prove it to you? Check your pocket. Could you reach into your- <laughs> <laughs> No, come on. What now? Buddy, you f up, boy. You tell the court what that was? Uh-huh. Why didn't you sense that this entire time? Do you recognize that man in back? His name is Huel Babino. He's on our witness. Really? Huel? Of course it is. He'll testify he planted this fully charged battery on you over an hour and a half. Yeah. Hour and 43 minutes. Boom. To the minute. And you felt nothing. It's a trick. It has enough to. is enough. I submit. Yeah. If he were schizophrenic, Schiz it wouldn't take away from the fact that the I defendant. I am not crazy. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I am not crazy. This is proving, unless I'm not, I'm not over, I'm not trying to overshadow the fact that what this proves is that it is mental, right? And we talked about that in season one. Now, I, I do want to talk about this for a second, actually, because it's really important. It's really important to talk about this. I was going to say if, but I think, you know, we are seeing that there is definitive proof here. I think the show is trying to tell us that this is a mental condition, mental illness, right? Now, while this changes something, it doesn't change his behavior. Because while something can affect you mentally, that does not excuse it, right? Now, I will draw attention to the uh, distinction of pre-pimento Chuck and post-pimento Chuck. Now, pre-pimento Chuck, we saw him very relaxed, very in his element. We kind of saw pure Chuck. I think, you know, look, the reason that I think the way that I do about Chuck is because I am very privileged and I'm very privy to the things that he does behind closed doors, right? The things that he does in regards to his brother. I honestly think if I met Chuck out and about in person, he'd be a perfectly nice enough man. And I think that's what we got pre-Pimento because all we saw was Jimmy getting on with him. All we saw was him interacting with people generally in a way that was kind of normal and nice. Then we peeled back the layer and we peeled back another layer and we got to see a little bit more about what was going on. You know, we got to see a little bit more about motivation. We got to see a little bit more about what he'd been doing. We got to see a little bit more about what he'd been doing in regard to Jimmy. 
and all the things that have led us here. If someone, I mean, you know, we, we had it dropped in this conversation here. If you have somebody who is schizophrenic and they behave a certain way, and let's say they hurt a person, you can understand why they did that considering their condition. That does not excuse them hurting that person. That doesn't make them hurting that person okay. Does that mean that they should be punished for hurting that person? No. I don't think I've ever said that I wanted Chuck to be punished for the things that he's doing. I think the only things that I've said, the only kind of uh, feeling that I've put forth is that I want Chuck to stop. I need Chuck to walk away. I need Jimmy to walk away. I've been very clear, I think, on the distinction of what I wanted from this. I've never said that I wanted him to be punished for that. And so my greater point, and this is delicate, but it's important, is that as much as this being proved as a mental condition might explain how he's been. And by the way, we don't know. I think perhaps we're going to, again, peel back another surface here, another layer here and see a bit more to this, because I don't think his condition necessarily, from what we've seen so far, has been influencing. Maybe we're going to, you know, shed some light on that and see how it has been influencing him and things and everything else. And that's fair. And I'll judge that when we get there. But if we see that there has been a mental condition that has actually actively been changing the way he thinks and influencing the way he behaves, while that can explain it, that does not justify or excuse the way he has treated his brother. It doesn't. You can't fall back on, well, he's mentally ill to explain the way he's treating his brother. That's not how that works. I have ADHD. And, 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 and I realize this is very different to what I've been talking about. I'm very bad at keeping time. I sometimes struggle to get out of bed and do things. I know in the past, for example, I've struggled to get to work because of that, right? The jobs that I've had. A lot of the time that can manifest itself in not doing the dishes, not really being able to get out of bed, not being able to do the things that I want to do, that I should do to make things easier for the people that I live with, right? Do the hoovering, do the laundry, cook dinner, even cook for myself. While my ADHD can explain all of that, it does not excuse me leaving that laundry to someone else, not cooking the food when it's my job to cook the food, essentially making sure that the other person doesn't eat either, not hoovering when it should be my turn, etc, 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 etc. While these things can explain and can garner empathy, and it does deserve empathy from us, the audience members, it absolutely does, of course it does. God, if this has been affecting him in a mental way, this has been working against him in a way that it's not working against X person or X person or X person. Things are much harder for him because of the thing. That should absolutely be acknowledged. Again, that does not excuse behavior that harms another person. Very important distinction. I've been very clear about it because it is important. But I will stress that this does not make the behavior and the actions that he has taken against Jimmy right. Does not just defy them. It doesn't. That's where I leave it. And he's not crazy. And we shouldn't treat him that way. One after Magna Carta, as if I could ever make such a mistake. Never. I just couldn't prove it. And it's sad, actually, because, yeah, Kim's right. They're going to hate him after this because he is. I think the whole point of this is to make Chuck look insane. And that is cruel. You think this is bad? This? This chicanery? Chicanery! Sorry. It's a good word. Hey, it's a good word. He defecated through a sunroof. He's lost it. Chuck has lost it. Couldn't keep his hands out of the cash drawer. Oh God, Chuck, stop. All of this, the truth. And that's what makes it sad because he sounds insane. To bring this all out right now, it sounds insane. And you do, you really pity Chuck for it. It's really sad. You know, Jimmy's in self-preservation mode at this point. He really is. You know, I can see both sides. And so I understand why Jimmy has done what he's done. It's really got to kind of the final straw. I think for both of these men, right? Chuck really came for Jimmy, really, really came for him. And in return, Jimmy has done the same thing. And I think the consequence of that is that we are getting a really sad eventuality for Chuck here. And I worry at the consequences that this is gonna have on Chuck, because I think he's lost it. I think he's, I think they're gonna root against him. I think Jimmy's gonna come out fine. I apologize. Oh, buddy, bless him. I lost my train of thought. I got carried away. Oh, blood buddy. Do you have anything else? Oh, Chuck. You've lost them. You have lost them. It's done. It's over. That's so sad. I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really sad that this vendetta, and I think it, look, it goes both ways. Chuck's got a vendetta against Jimmy, and Jimmy can't let it go. And this is where we've got to, right, as a result of that. And there's blame on both sides. And as much as Chuck is telling the truth, as much as Chuck did the right thing at one time, and he did, I've referenced that a lot in keeping Jimmy from jail. All he had to do was see how his brother had changed, and he didn't. 
and then suddenly after a chain of events we find ourselves here it just it's so sad god it's so i hate I, I i genuinely hate this i genuinely hate that chuck's been driven here and he did do the good thing and he i think because of his own internal i hesitate to call them failings because it's not his fault again i think it's society i think it's his parentage i think it's the era that he was brought up in have made him this way suppressing his own emotions right because i think a lot of people you know of that generation did do have all of that has come together to create this situation and it's so beautifully wrought by the writers so beautifully written it makes absolute sense and if you both understand jimmy you support jimmy but you understand chuck as well and you feel sorry for chuck as well and all of that exists at one time and it makes this beautiful horrible mess that has this like tearing inside of me do you know what i mean inside the audience of like i don't know how to feel almost because i feel all of these things but this is this is done this is done chuck I'm so sorry and what should be a moment of victory for jimmy is turned instead into a very genuinely tragic moment for chuck like i feel so sorry for him and i think just existentially like that is a very real realization to chuck that it's not just physical damn damn i'm i'm a little upset honestly because yeah it is hard to watch it really is hard to watch but i i do i stand by everything that i said as difficult as it is to talk about and as real as it is because it's very real and uh i think people like chuck do exist obviously they exist and uh should be given our consideration i think the the particular order of events and ingredients in this situation right here make it very back and forth very gray um and i think it makes it a very beautiful scene a very beautiful episode and it's so interesting actually because yeah this is what halfway through the season yeah there's 10 episodes i worry for chuck to be honest my impulse my feeling of him not coming out of this is increasing and actually i wonder at the tragedy being increased just because if he actually finally realizes that it is not physical it is a mental i mean you saw the reaction when uh, mr ali accused not accused but even mentioned dared to mention mental illness and schizophrenia the outburst from chuck he doesn't want to be associated with that at all which probably isn't helping find a diagnosis, right? But you saw the effect that it had on him. I think that's the important thing because I think that effect, if he actually does truly realize that there is more to it than just the physical, I think that's gonna have a really, really deep adverse effect on him. Just from what I saw of his reaction to that, and I worry, I do really, really worry about the consequences of what happened in that courtroom. Yeah, we shall see. But that was Chicanery episode five. Um, yeah, look, I'm going to end that there. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, as always, to my uh, beautiful patrons. Thank you so much for your support. Um, early access to more of my YouTube content down there, all my videos and, uh, you know, uh, extra stuff as well. Hey, if this was your first time watching Better Call Saul Sundays, consider subscribing if you enjoyed. Uh, like the video, all that stuff. Help me get to 10K. Boom. Hey, if not, no worries. But uh, hey, consider watching this video right here more of the same coming your way but other than that thank you so much for watching genuinely again and i will see you very very soon thanks for watching see you later